Okay, these notes are going to be on uh, rocks, minerals, and mining mostly. Um, so we'll start with minerals. Minerals, as it says, naturally occurring solid inorganic material with a crystalline structure and a definite chemical composition. Examples would be quartz, silver, gypsum. Um, let's see, so this mineral, mineral, uh, mineral, and this probably most people can identify this from earth science, this is quartz. Um, a rock, on the other hand, is a mixture of minerals. So a really good example of this, because a lot of people have countertops or certain items in their home made out of this, is uh, granite. Okay, granite is actually considered a rock because it's a mixture of feldspar, quartz, and mica. And here is a picture of quartz, or sorry, of uh, granite. And lastly, sorry, uh, mineral resource is a resource that can be extracted and converted into a resource at affordable prices. Um, we'll get to some of those here in a little bit. Um, aluminum, iron, these are all important mineral resources. Okay, so here are some processes that are important in the rock cycle. Uh, we have what's called weathering. Weathering is just breaking down rocks into smaller pieces, and there's two different types of weathering. You can have mechanical weathering, which is just you are somehow physically breaking that mineral into a smaller into smaller pieces. This can be done by um, plant roots. Plant roots breaking through a mineral would physically break them apart. Uh, animals, lots of actions of animals. You have lots of animals that live in the soil that would break stuff down. Um, also, you have larger animals that could physically break minerals into smaller pieces. A uh, process that's called freeze-thaw, where um, you have ice forms, and they actually form ice wedges. Like in, in, A lot of times this happens in a large boulder. Um, you would have water enter a wedge in the boulder, and then it would freeze. And when it does this, we know ice expands, and it would actually break apart chunks of rock that way. And then you have chemical weathering, which means you're chemically breaking down that mineral into smaller pieces. So lichens, um, acids would all be able to do that, chemically break them down. Uh, rocks are continually weathered to form smaller particles, and this process is called sedimentation. And then we have another process called erosion that takes these small sediments and moves them elsewhere. So picking up small sediments, carrying them away, moving them somewhere else, that's what erosion is. We're going to go through many examples here in a second. Um, uh, you have erosion by wind, and we'll look at something that's called desert pavement in a second. Sand dunes are created through uh, wind erosion. Um, abrasion on rocks is something that happens due to wind erosion. Um, erosion due to water. Uh, beaches are formed by water erosion. Levees, oxbow lakes, meanders and rivers and lakes um, and rivers, sorry, are caused by water erosion. Uh, erosion by ice and glaciers. Um, we have some really cool mountains and valleys that have been shaped due to glaciers retreating, so we'll look at those. And When they retreat, they drop down these big huge boulders. Um, especially mountains that's got these really pretty horn shapes to them. Those have been carved out through glaciers. Um, and then erosion due to gravity would be things like mudslides and landslides, which we've already talked about. Here's some pictures showing you erosion by wind. So again, sand, sand dunes, desert. We have a lot of uh, wind erosion happening here. Uh, this picture is kind of cool. This is showing a rock that suffered a lot of wind abrasion. So we're in a very sedimented area, and the wind's going to pick up all these little tiny rocks, brush them up against this rock, and this rock has had many abrasions on it. Um, let me move this over here. This is going to show you how something called desert pavement forms. So ordinarily you've got this uh, kind of this light fluffy sand in the desert, and it shows as, these, as the wind kind of blows past it and picks up more and more sediments, it's going to pick up the lighter stuff and leave behind the heavier, more dense rocks. Um, and then over time, you actually form this dense desert pavement. And so that's what we're seeing here. Instead of a nice, light, sandy area, it's more of a dense, rocky area. So again, that's wind erosion. Erosion by water. This is a pretty cool slide. It shows you all the stuff that's kind of been carved out by water. Um, 
here we've got barges that water has carved out. Uh, these ones are really cool. Um, this obviously used to all be solid rock, but we've got this neat little structure here due to water eroding out little cavities in it. Um, same thing with all these formations out here. I can make this picture a little bit bigger. All of these formations were all part of one solid chunk of land, and they were all carved out by the water. Um, this is called, these are called oxbows or meanders in a, in a river. Um, a river is always going to originate at the top of a mountain from ice melt, and so that ice melt comes down the mountain, and as it comes down the mountain to the flat land, which we call the floodplain, that water starts to meander in these predictable patterns called oxbow lakes. So, um, this is, and you can see here where you've got, you know, you've got the, the deep cut on the edges, but then you've got the, all this like sandy kind of bank in the middle. And again, that's all water kind of cutting through the land. It's eroding it. And then here is a uh, delta where the water is uh, leaving the river, entering the ocean. And again, you've got a lot of erosion happening here. Erosion by gravity. Again, we've already talked about landslides and mudslides and mass movement, so here's some other good pictures of that. And lastly, erosion by glaciers. Glaciers are huge, very, very old chunks of ice. Uh, a lot of them we still find in mountain ranges. And these mountain ranges, as you can see, these really pretty kind of U-shaped valleys here. You can actually see some of the remnants of the glaciers, but this all used to be filled up with ice. And what happens is as these glaciers melt, they retreat and they move back and they actually carve out these pretty valleys. So this is a really neat picture. You can see how all of this stuff has been carved out by the ice over time. And of course, this takes a long, long time. And we're also seeing that here as the glacier retreats, it forms valleys. Over here, we see these piles of till. Um, when glaciers do melt, a lot, oftentimes they drop off a lot of rocks and they leave this behind in their path. Okay, so, and again, these really pretty pointy mountaintops a lot of times are formed by a glacier. So the pretty pointy mountaintops called the horns, and then these U-shaped valleys. Okay, so let's go into the rock cycle now, and hopefully this takes you back to earth science if you took that, or if not, middle school science. There's three different types of rocks. You have igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Uh, igneous is going to be the most common rock on earth comes from volcanoes, comes from cooled magma. Um, they've got some interesting looks to them. Some of them are kind of puffy and light and airy like this. And so your traditional um, example of this would be pumice. Okay, Obsidian, I don't have a cool picture of that, but obsidian is really, really neat. Obsidian is that really shiny black kind of sharp stone. They actually used to use them in, in uh, weapons and stuff, but that is formed from... Uh, magma, it's igneous. We also have basalt and granite. So these are all igneous rocks formed from uh, volcanoes. Sedimentary rock uh, comes from compression or compaction of sediments. So this, one's, this, one, this one to me is kind of one of the easiest ones to remember and kind of one of the easiest ones to identify because it's going to look like a whole bunch of se uh, sediments kind of compacted together. Um, and a lot of these names actually sound like they would be sedimentary rocks. Like, for instance, sandstone is a rock made out of, um, well, it sounds like it's, you know, a bunch of little sediments kind of compacted together. So I think of sandstone, I think of a bunch of little teeny tiny sediments compacted together. Uh, conglomerate, again, conglomerate, you've got like a big mixture of a lot of different sediments together. And they look kind of sedimenty. They've got little specks of stuff in it. And uh, limestone is sedimentary. Limestone is a big rock on our planet. Um, and here is siltstone. So again, we're we'll talking about silt here in an, another week or so. Um, that's probably pretty easy to remember as well. It's sedimentary, made out of little sediments. And then metamorphic is formed from these uh, sedimentary and igneous rocks that have been subjected to really, really high heat and high pressure. Um, so a lot of times they end up with this cool kind of striated, stripey look to them because they've been heated and pressed um, to form this superheated kind of squished rock. Okay, uh, Some good examples of that would be marble and slate. 
again, if you think about what those two rocks look like, marble has a lot of striations in it. Slate actually has the sheets to it, like the little individual sheets. So those both are characteristic of a metamorphic rock. And here, this rock is called Nice. That's how this is pronounced, Nice. And again, it's got a striated, striped look to it. Okay, so we said uh, we have many mineral, minerals that are actually valuable to us, and we actually extract them to get the stuff that we want out of them. Um, the actual, the whole chunk of rock that's going to have the valuable stuff to us, we call that the ore. Here's an example of an ore, it's called bauxite. And we get aluminum from that, so these little specks would be aluminum that we would have to get out of that ore. And we can extract an, another ore called hematite, and that's going to have uh, iron in it that we like to get from it. And here are some of the metals that we... Uh, most commonly used around the world would be iron, aluminum, manganese, copper, chromium, and nickel. Okay, some other resources that we like uh, would be mica, which is kind of a really pretty reflective rock. Um, it's used in a whole bunch of stuff. It's, I know it's even used in makeup. Um, limestone, gravel, sand, graphite, think pencils, quartz, diamonds, and other gemstones. So these are all valuable resources to us. Sand and gravel are used in bricks and concrete. Silica sand is what glass is made from. And then limestone is also used in concrete, road rock, building stone, and then we use uh, lime for agricultural and uh, in, in the water, we use it in aquatics. And we also use it in power plants as scrubbers, which we'll learn about later. Okay, mining, there are four different types of mines, and we'll do a neat mining activity in um, class as well. So let's go over the four different types. First of all, we have a placer mine, uh, then you have an open pit mine, strip mine, and a subsurface mine. So the placer mine is just, it's, um, it's on the surface, okay, it's not underground or anything like that, and it's mostly um, deals with getting valuables like gold and diamonds from water, from streams. So here we have um, apparatus that they use to kind of sift out any of these valuable things as the water comes through it. Issues with t this type of mine is that it can contaminate surface water. Um, due to the cans they use to kind of hose down the sides of the, um, the hillsides to get the minerals that they're looking for. Open pit mines, I've got a good picture of this on the next slide too. Um, think of if you think of a quarry, I know there's a lot of quarries in the area that you can drive by and see them look like big huge holes in the ground. That's what an open pit mine is. Uh, it's mostly used for sand, gravel, and copper. Um, an environmental issue that we experience with these is that they, they frequently fill with water once they're abandoned. Um, this can result in acidification or concentration of heavy metals and that can, stuff can actually leak into the soil, it can leak back out into the environment. Um, so a really important practice to do with any sort of mine is to do reclamation practices which is which means to replace any soil that you've moved and to return the habitat the way that it used to be. Um, a strip mine is the next one and that's also known as a surface mine. Uh, this is mostly used to remove coal, uh, especially out in western U.S. Uh, with this one, you're just removing top, topsoil and surface rock from land. You remove the mineral of interest that you want. You replace the surface rock back to where it was. Um, and now these areas are called spoil banks. So you strip off the top layer, take what you want, put the stuff back. It's not going to be the same, though. Um, so these spoil banks, is, now that they're called that, uh, what environmental issues they face is that they can be as susceptible to weathering and erosion because, again, that ground, you've, you've taken stuff from it, you've, you've disrupted that ground. It's not going to be intact and in place the same way it used to be. Uh, we don't have any more topsoil anymore, so that rich topsoil we're going to learn about in another week or so uh, is very important for the wildlife that wants to live there. Um, this is going to cause really, really long recovery. And back in the 70s, Congress actually passed a Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act, uh, which requires that mined areas be returned to their original state. Uh, we replant the soil, which would help with some of these erosion and um, plant issues. And um, we're actually going to read an article about that later too. So that, that was, it's, it's been beneficial, but once you once you disrupt the land like this, it's never really going to go back to the way it was. 
All right, and then the last one is a subsurface mine. This is what we think of as like a real mine. This is the underground, the little underground cart. Uh, this is mostly used to harvest tin, lead, copper, and coal. Uh, problems we have with these subsurface mines, they can collapse. We can have explosions, uh, or they can even catch on fire and stay on fire for years, which we actually talked about this Pennsylvania example at the beginning of the year. We said that in the Pennsylvania one, it was on fire for 40 years. Uh, apparently there's one in China that's been on fire for 400 years. Um, another issue with these subsurface mines is that they can also contaminate groundwater with heavy metals. Um, so here's some pictures real quick of those the last three types of mines I talked about. Here's the open pit, which we said is basically a quarry. Here's your strip mining, where you take off the top layer, get what you want, and replace the land. And here's the subsurface that's all the way underground. Let me see, did I miss something? Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about smelting and heap leach extraction. So we get the ore out of the ground. Now how do we actually get that aluminum out of that bauxite ore that we want? What we have to do is we have to heat it. Okay, we have to heat that rock to get that desired metal out of it and when we do that, excuse me, uh, we release a lot of air pollution, uh, especially sulfur dioxide. Okay, so that's called smelting, heating it and that releases sulfur di dioxide. Heap leach extraction is spraying an ore with a cyanide solution that's going to dissolve the gold or the silver out of the ore and this, as you can imagine, is going to uh, possibly contaminate the local uh, environment. Okay, so we've already talked about some of these, but here are some definite environmental effects that would happen due to mining. So, the first one is kind of no duh, you're destroying the land. Um, this is going to lead to habitat loss for wildlife. Uh, also, if you're removing any sort of plant and you're doing deforestation, we know that that's going to encourage erosion. Uh, all of the machinery that we use in the mining industry is also going to be involved in releasing pollution, especially sulfur dioxide. Um, we talked about several instances where we would be, re be releasing contaminants back out into the water. Um, we talked about how certain things can lead to acidification. So we actually, if, if the mine becomes acidified and then it leaks, we call this acid mine drainage. Um, so you're leaking um, acidified water, which can acidify streams, um, which can obviously kill a lot of wildlife and reduce biodiversity. And then we talked about that heap leach extraction on the last slide. So you're spraying stuff with cyanide. Uh, if you're using cyanide, we also use mercury in mining. Um, these other toxins, if they get out into the environment, uh, they can really affect the, the local wildlife that lives there. Okay, we're, we're going to read another article about this law too. This is a really kind of messed up law. Um, it's from the 1800s and it's called the General Mining Law. And what it was is it's this law, it was passed to encourage people to use federal lands to increase their commerce. And basically people can stake claims on their land and purchase it very, very, very cheaply. So you can buy this federal land, stake claims on it, um, take any ore that you want without paying extra money to the government. Okay, so I guess people have kind of really taken advantage of this. They've bought land for very cheap and they're able to get a lot of um, resources from it without having to pay much for it. Also, they're not really being held accountable for any environmental issues that they're causing. So some people are saying that maybe a little caveat to this should be if they're going to do all of this, then they need to help with the cleanup afterwards. Okay, so we're talking about these uh, important mineral resources we get from the ground. How can we conserve these geologic resources? The um, main way we can do this is by recycling. So in order to save a lot of money and a lot of energy that's needed to actually go into the earth and mine this stuff and then smelt it out of the ore, uh, we can just keep stuff in the mix and recycle. That's why recycling is so important. Um, here are some successes that we've had with recycling. They say the most successfully recycled material in our country right now is steel. And they say pretty much all steel 
that we are using is at least 25% recycled. Um, it's, it's very easy to melt back down, it's very easy to recycle, and we've done a really good job of recycling steel. Uh, aluminum is another one that we've done a good job with. Again, it's very easy to recycle, very easy to remelt and make into other cans and you get a really good turnaround from that and again we're not having to go back into the earth extract more ore use all of that energy just to get more aluminum that's already in circulation um, some other metals that can be recycled are lead platinum gold silver copper iron i know especially like with girls um, in jewelry parties a big thing now is to bring your old gold and silver and to sell it to these gold and silver ladies and they take it and they remelt it and they give you a couple hundred bucks for your old gold and silver so hang on to that stuff because you can you can sell it back and uh, recycle it and get money for it and that is it for our notes today